Brilliant. Well, thanks to um, people who've just logged in. I'm going to still give it um, just a couple minutes just to let people join. And as you'll see, we've got Alexander Milash, Isla Angus, and Laura Pando here, and myself. I'm love well, artist called Love Sega. And um, and thanks to the Haley Space, the Haley Space for for hosting this panel. So and bringing everyone together. So I'll just give it, like I said, I'll just give it a couple of minutes for people to join. And um, and then hopefully we can have the get the conversation going. And then also at the end there'll be time for a Q and A. And um, it's going to be we're going to see. There's no real firm firm structure. We're going to see where it kind of goes. But then hopefully it's going to be of interest to people listening. And it's good to see a couple more joining, um, which is good. And as for myself, it's interesting because you never know who's going to be attending these panels. Um, so we try and keep it uh, broad. But what is quite, what would be quite good uh, now is for people to feel like they can take away some next steps and some actionable things rather than just having so many panels where it's just like a talking shop going round and round and all agreeing. Because the big challenge is clearly if people have um, signed in to, to listen to this panel they will have a vested interest in this but then it's attracting the broader consensus people who aren't so interested and then to make it um, of value to them and how to spread the message and the good work that everyone here on the panel does and I feel very um, honored and proud to be hosting it today hmm. so um, what we'll do is it's now three minutes past I'll start I'll start with the introductions. So welcome everybody on this very hot Thursday, uh, 25th of June. And thank you to the, the Halley Space, to this um, webinar, which is Sustain, the opportunity to create a unified response to the climate emergency. And we're very lucky to have three esteemed panelists here. Myself, I'm just the host. I'm Love Sega. I'm an artist producer and I have an, well, a science background for my sins and an interest in uh, the climate emergency, climate justice. And I've been fortunate something, uh, thanks to gentleman Adam Callan, who's on here um, to be involved in um, Earth Percent, which is a project which is starting up, which you'll hear more of a bit later on, um, hopefully the work that we're doing. But even better, we've got people who've been doing this, not just today, not just last year, but for a number of years. So it's to bring them into the com conversation. So we've got three panelists. We've got Alexander Milas, who, um, Alexander, Alex is an archeologist, music journalist, and editor in chief of Metal Hammer. Um, he found, uh, founded Twin V Limited, creative solutions and production company, also the World Metal Congress, and Space Rocks with the European Space Agency. And he also, from a philanthropic side, um, runs Heavy Metal Truants Cycling Charity, which he co-founded in 2013 with Rod Smallwood, uh, Iron Maiden's manager. And they have raised £700,000 to date for Teenage Cancer Trust, Nordoff Rod Robbins and Childline. So that's fantastic. Uh, great to have um, Alex here. And then we've got, uh, also we've got um, Isla Angus as well, who's, um, who's an agent, a live agent, and has a fantastic resume in the, in the UK and has worked for um, ATC Live, who look after Lumineers, Mac DeMarco, Passenger, Strome, who I love, Belgium, uh, Soak and Sleaford Mods. And sh right now she's on sabbatical working with Client Earth, uh, which is a very, very um, influential and important charity doing some fantastic work on climate action. So I'm excited as well to hear from her the work there. And also because I'm assuming most people are in the music industry here, it's great to see that intersection between the live side, the actual industry side, and then also the climate justice um, side as well. So it'd be great to hear her thoughts. And then lastly, we've got Laura Pando from um, Julie's Bicycle. So um, Laura has a great career um, over 10 years in, in the music industry, in the festival, international festival side. She was sustainability manager of Festival Republic from 2011 to 2015. So there we're talking Latitude, Electric Picnic, Reading and Leeds. And she was in charge of um, great um, carbon reductions and uh, 
environmental optimizations in these festivals, which received three IG star ratings for across all criteria for Reading and Leeds from 2012 to 2014 and 2013, 2014 for, for Leeds. So that's real practical experience there. And then now since joining Julie's Bicycle in 2016, um, she holds an overview of Arts Council England's environmental program and focused on working with cultural organizations and how to understand and improve their environmental performance. And that, that's the introduction, it's, such, it's a great panel. And I think it's important to uh, introduce the panelists because of course these are the bios, but people might not read the bio, so it's important to hear the great work that they're doing. And also it might help direct questions afterwards for the Q&A. So the, ha the Halley, who are hosting this event, um, the Halley is a space for independent minds with music at its heart. The Halley space is a shared workspace, music studios and creative suite event space and a cafe on the canal in Haggerston for individuals and businesses in and around the music industry, which will be launching in July. Construction was paused for lockdown and in the meantime, they've been building up their community online with a series of online events called the Opportunity in the Crisis, aiming to give advice to people working in the music industry during this uncertain period. Okay, great. So that's all of the introductions. So if I'll just give a structure of how it's roughly going to go, what I'd quite like is we'll spend about five minutes from each of our panelists for them to have an opportunity to present what they've been working um, on in the climate space or anything that's happening right now at the moment, which is of note, and then the talk will extend from that. And um, then obviously towards the end, we'll have the, the Q&A at about 5 p.m. So my as a host, I'm also just a, a listener um, here. So I'll be intrigued just to see how the conversation goes. And for people who've been following what's going on, it's been, it's well, a terrible time for music industry um, and everybody from a health point of view and also from a business point of view, people with, in terms of jobs and in terms of live um, acts. But the key thing is to think as myself as an artist and my artist friends were thinking, how do we come out of it? Do we come out of it? Um, going back to the same thing, protecting our vested interests, or is now a, now a time in this pause to actually think, okay, look, how do we correct the wrongs that we have been doing beforehand? And what actionable things can we do? And um, one thing which I just touch upon is obviously now we're seeing with um, just with Black Lives Matter and um, people looking at inequality, whether it's gender inequality, whether it's, um, off the back of the good work of the, the Me Too movement, whether it's deprivation, which is also linked to um, climate justice, all of these different things, dependence on fossil fuels. Now we're seeing an awakening because people are at home and they are looking for ways in which they can um, use their energy and their expertise and everything to come together to push it forward. So with that, Julie's Bicycle this week, they've just um, been doing well, great work all the time, not just this week, but there have been some big developments. So I think that's a good place to introduce Laura now, um, just to talk about what's been happening um, uh, this week with Julie's Bicycle and some of the broader things. Sure, thank you so much, Sega, and thank you to Paolo and the Halley for inviting us to be here. Uh, it's probably worth it just explaining, first of all, before I get into the kind of uh, into the thick of what's been happening this week, which is uh, very exciting. There's still a lot of work to do. Uh, just to explain what Julie's Bicycle is with this peculiar name that we have. Uh, we're an environmental charity. We've been, uh, we've been uh, uh, working in this space, specifically with the creative industries, since uh, 2007. And, and actually, we started in the music industry. That's our kind of like at home, if, if that makes sense. Although we very rapidly expanded to other areas of the kind of creative industries and the cultural community as well. So we work across all cultural uh, and artistic and, and creative uh, spaces at the moment. But the focus is basically just to, to support the creative sector in, in power and action on climate change, on being the real drivers of this, this conversation and the transformation, not just the conversation, not just the narrative. Uh, because we historically have been seen as a community, as a kind of, great conveyor of, of, of messaging, but actually what we are as a community and due to due the specifics of, of what we do, uh, uh, we are actually a, a, a source of actually finding real solutions, implementing them, scaling them up, and actually just uh, finding those innovative solutions that we are going to need uh, if we want the future that we, uh, that we want to live in, basically. So we started by uh, really looking at what, is it, what are the impacts of, of the activity of the creative industries, and from then 
and by looking at the impact, I mean actually calculating the carbon footprint, which sounds like a kind of uh, ethereal thing, uh, but it's basically what our activity is actually pumping out into the atmosphere and contributing to this big, great problem that we have with uh, climate change and cli you know, uh, climate warming. And from that, we actually got the information or the basic information that we needed to start building resources, uh, practical resources with the sector. So we've always collaborated alongside the experts, the cultural and creative sector experts to develop these tools about, okay, so what is a sustainable production? So what is sustainable touring? What does it really entail? What do we need to change? What is the kind of like policies, decision-making, investment, uh, areas, people that we need to involve to make these things really happen and transform the way we understand ourselves and our activity. And, and obviously that's one part of it. The other part and the reason why we work with the creative industries is obviously because it's that capacity to, to really connect with people at a very human level, to really transform and, 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 and really make it very tangible uh, to, to, to people, to citizens, to audiences, to public. Uh, what is this thing about climate change? Does it really have to do with me? What does it have to do with my, my daily decisions as an individual, as an organization, as a community uh, and as societies? Uh, and obviously, I don't need to explain that. We all know the power of uh, art and culture and creativity. So this is what we do. We operate at three different levels. We, we support organizations and individuals in their practice uh, in a very kind of nuts and bolts, a very specific, but also we extract the knowledge of that, of that exercise and that work, and we turn it into resources that actually are applied to sector level. So we have programs to support the whole sector and that we do with training, with resources, guides, uh, you know, networking and so on. But also what we do, the third area, is to actually take it into a policy level. Because we understand that it's only so much that as individuals, as organizations, uh, and sometimes even as networks that we can do to change this great wicked problem challenge that we have with climate change that goes across, you know, many, many other areas that, you know, that, that, that are related to our human activity. Uh, and it's basically take it to the kind of policy space and, and, and try to fight for those structural systemic changes and, and, and really unlock the investments and, and, and the, you know, the plans, the strategies that are going to really help us as a sector to really drive this agenda forward. So it is here where actually we, this week, we, we put together this letter that we sent to the Secretary um, of Culture here in the UK, just asking them to really take this moment that we experienced, as Sega was saying, really challenging, difficult time from the perspective, personal perspective, from a health perspective, from the financial uh, you know, perspective, that we're going through this this COVID-19 has really all you know shaken us all up uh great changes that we never thought would be possible are happening now um in a really dramatic way and uh and the sector is going to need a, a recovery plan so we're advocating for that recovery plan to have at the heart of it a transition that is just and is green and when i mean it's just it's actually creative climate is uh, sorry the um, the climate challenge is, is not just related to the temperatures in the world or whether the sea levels are going to rise. It's, it's all of that. But also, it is about the kind of deep inequalities in systems that have allowed this, this, uh, this injustice uh, to happen across, across the world. And, you know, we're seeing it very linked now with the Black Lives Matter moment that we, you know, living now. And, and we really want to connect uh, climate change with climate justice and actually just make that recovery plan really at the heart of, you know, at the heart of these issues and really driving them. So we put together that letter, 700 organizations have already endorsed it. Uh, so we, I would invite you to go to our, onto our website, juliusbicycle.com and just to have a read and, and if you agree, just put your name behind it as well. But we're planning to, you know, to really engage um, further and to really kind of like unpack uh, hopefully alongside the government if they, if, they, if they want to, what a plan could look like to really uh, drive our cultural sector and our cultural economy and our cultural life to a place that feels just and sustainable and it will enable us to meet those big targets, international targets of reducing our carbon emissions uh, to net zero carbon by 2050 if we're to meet those uh, climate targets that we have ahead of us. So I think that's that's pretty much us in a nutshell. In terms of um, action and things in SEGA, if I go over my time, just give me, <laughs> give me the heads up. 
um, just just to kind of like think about ourselves and interpret like you know what different ways you can you can act on this you you have your voices as artists potentially so you can use them either through your creativity and through your work or you can actually use them as uh, as activists you will have a platform if you're artists so what messages are you getting behind uh, also think about your practice think about how you can collaborate and break the silos between you know, between the people that you work with, whether they're suppliers, whether they're subcontractors, whether they are venues, and actually look at the areas where you can actually just work together. That collaboration for us is an aspect that we always encourage people to, to look into because that's, you know, that's how we accelerate um, knowledge exchange and, and, and there's that space in that collaboration where innovation uh, always happens as well. Um, also think about who do you can influence maybe there are things that are beyond your control that you can't change but certainly you can always you know endorse these big moments like uh, like this letter but also join up bigger movements like for example system to change is a program um, a, a celebration of environmental artwork that is happening across the country and it's just launched but just have a look as well we, we're working on that in collaboration with arts admin and join other movements like the news to declares emergency which is obviously uh, a great platform to connect with many other people within the music industry who are really keen to to make this happen. There's a hell of a lot of resources in there uh, available, whether you're an artist or a promoter or a man, you know a venue. Doesn't really matter. There's always something to do. So so yeah, basically just use your voice, use your uh, your platforms, collaborate, and whatever you cannot change, at least try and advocate for that change and just make some noise. But you know, I'm here to to chat about any ideas or questions or suggestions after after our talks. Yeah, that's that's fantastic, um, Laura. And actually, it's really good how you brought that um, mentioning all the other organisations because I think this is the important thing. This is not a party political broadcast where we need everyone to work together, and we need it's a global pro it's a global problem. Like now, it's what, thirty one degrees in London. It's 38 degrees in the Arctic, in Siberia. We've got the forest fires. You've got all the different um, things going on. Um, we need to be together and it's great for you to highlight the other um, organizations. And um, policy is an important thing. And I would challenge everyone who's um, on this webinar as well, just to see with Julie's bicycle, even though um, she's being modest here, there are a number of reports, lots and lots of reports there. So you may feel, okay, I'm an artist. Um, I need to wait for the record label or I'm manager. I need to wait for my artist to speak. Just um, maybe put in the, in, the, in the chat or somewhere and just say, okay, look, are there different ways in which um, you might have the resources? So maybe you can ask later and you'll be surprised. So next we'll go to um, Isla from Client Earth. Hello. Yeah, just to uh, reiterate, it was great, Laura, to hear you uh, bringing everything so well together there and I definitely think the sort of campaigning and advocacy work that Julie's Bicycle do is, is amazing and super important in this space right now. Um, as you mentioned as well, Sega, I um, have started just at Client Earth not too long ago. In fact, I started two weeks before lockdown. Um, before that, I was an agent for a decade and prior to that, I was a promoter. And I guess like probably everybody on here is increasingly worried about the climate crisis. And I spent a lot of time trying to devise ways for artists to tour in a more sustainable way, including uh, using Julie, Julie's Bicycle help to implement that at ATC in my previous company, Earth. But I also spent a lot of time trying to not think about the climate crisis as well and trying to sort of uh, ignore it. And then when I started working at Client Earth, uh, I've been able to look at it afresh or look at it face on rather. So a bit about Client Earth, it's been called the world's most environmental, uh, most effective environmental organization. It was uh, voted that by a number of other environmental NGOs in 2017 and 2018. And so the sort of big sexy work in a way that they do. The headline work is taking governments and big businesses to courts and forcing them to deliver on their legal obligations to the environment and to people too. And 
under the scope of that court work, that legal work, we've stopped dozens of coal plants. Um, we've had court cases across Europe include, against air pollution, including London, which has given us the right to for citizens to have access to clean air here. Um, and there's too many to go into, but yeah, just to, uh, Client Earth's also built a whole system of environmental protections, legal protections in China, which didn't exist before that. So in the last six or seven years. And then outside of China, uh, we work with the EU, we work with governments, worldwide, local governments, uh, international bodies, other NGOs, partners everywhere. There's a lot of cross-sector collaboration um, there. And there's the background work or the work that doesn't get to the papers is um, all the enormous amount of work done informing and enforcing the law and then advising decision makers and policies too, and also training the legal prof professionals and judges, lawyers, etc., in other countries. And yeah, so the reason for me moving to Client Earth, I guess, was it feels like an organization able to enact sy systemic change. It's kind of groundbreaking work. Um, and I guess since working here, I've definitely been able to close that gap between worrying about climate change and doing something. Uh, and that's really a feeling that I wish I could bring to everyone. Uh, perhaps we all have it in, in, on this panel that, you know, closing the gap between what you want to do and doing it. Um, and also, this is an important thing as well, I think, removing the guilt about individual actions. Um, though definitely individual actions have a cumulative effect and perhaps just on public opinion as much as anything, I guess ultimately we need to move away from fossil fuel and that's sort of not within any of our one power to give that sort of systemic change can only be le leveraged at government and business level with the power of all other bodies around it. Um, you know, including Julie's Bicycle, including what's going to be Earth Percent, including Music Declares Emergency, including all the organisations which are based in the US doing the same stuff. So uh, really talk of a long time here, but just in a nutshell, so my role at uh, Client Earth is as a sort of cultural liaison person, and I'm here to deepen connections with music and arts and culture ultimately to support the work of the lawyers and the legal team, whether that's by bringing awareness to the work, uh, bringing funding to the work, bringing just general support to the work. Uh, the reason for them appointing a music stroke culture person, i.e. me, is there's already been a num there's been a lot of a history of support from the music industry. So Brian Eno was one of the first trustees. He's been there since the word go Coldplay. David Gilmore gave us a sort of game-changing donation last year. Um, we've got newer people coming on board, like Rina Sawayama and Caribou have put these plus one tours in place, you know, where each ticket buyer donates. Uh, I mean, they, they don't get the choice. They have to give <laughs> a donation of a pound or a euro on the top of each ticket price. And then um, I guess it's just some examples of the sort of support the massive amount really of support, of individual support and whole company support from within the music industry, both people working in it, uh, mus musicians, labels, etc. And yet, probably also to echo, Laura, what you were saying before, just that one of the biggest gifts musicians and music industry can give to any cause is airtime and that access to new audiences um, the idea of a trusted person supporting a cause uh, is it really deepens and, and broadens the work and the scope of the work you're doing. So yeah, look forward to discussing how we're going to do that in this coming panel. That's fantastic. Thank you very much um, for that. And uh, also, it's great to hear. And I hope everyone who's um, who's on on this. Uh, uh, webinar who's, who's listening in can hear how these organizations who've been advocating it while we're at the highest governmental level they're not just stuck in their in the law courts or whatever they're actively looking um, to reach out to artists to managers and forward 
facing people, or it could even be footballers, as we've seen with Marcus Rashford and his uh, campaigns. And even when we look at um, the power of the K-pop fans and the TikTok fans, where they had a goal to, you know, distort yeah. because of Donald Trump's uh, campaign. If if it's crossing that divide, linking up, and then saying, look, hold on, we can now focus on something. We may mm -hmm. find, um, as Isla was saying, it's, it's nice where it could just be the airtime to give, which people do have. Obviously, people might be struggling financially in this thing, but you can still give your, your time. And that's sort of my angle, wanting to, um, to get involved. So next, we go over to Alex, and um, who um, will give a nice introduction. And also, one of the things which... Um, I'd like Alex to kind of touch upon is obviously he's worked with some gigantic bands. So some people here might be thinking, okay, look, I've got these high powered contacts. How easy or how practical is it to actually draw them into something? So over to you. Alex. Well, you know, uh, I, you know, uh, I got to first say, you know, how complimented I feel to be here and, um, you know, two incredibly wonderful acts to follow. And um, there is so much that's already been said that's really chimed with me um, because, uh, you know, I, you know, I got I to say, I wish I could take credit for this wonderful statement. Um, and it was, uh, it was earlier this year. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, it feels like January is literally a million years ago now. Um, but it was actually at the Academy Awards. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you remember this, but, you know, Hakeem Phoenix took the, uh, the stage. And he said, it, it doesn't matter if you're fighting for, um, if you're fighting against racial inequality, um, you know, gender inequality, whatever else, what so many of these causes are united by is just this universal um, fight against injustice, you know, wherever it is. And, uh, uh, and I guess as we discovered in the, uh, this, this crisis um, we're in, uh, the climate crisis is inextricably linked from, you know, inextricably linked with other, you know, um, deeply set, you know, issues as well, which I think is why, you know, I am here. Um, I think it's why we're all here is because we're all kind of you know, united by this desire to, to change the world we're in. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess I've been uniquely privileged because I've been able to do a few different things, um, you know, uh, with the fundraising that I've done, you know, I've seen what the power of community can be, you know, when you simply give people a simple way of acting, you know, uh, because, you know, words are important. But, uh, but actions, you know, as, as previously been said, are, are so much more profound, you know, because that's where you really begin to affect change. And so it's important not just to hear things that you agree with, but then to be given a way to actually make a difference, right? You know, and, uh, you know, I've seen how that can be affected uh, with the space agency, you know, uh, I work with the European Space Agency and, you know, they're kind of unique in that, you know, they can speak unambiguously about the climate crisis, you know, in terms that are both powerful uh, you know, and, you know, upsetting, but very, very real, because, you know, as we see so frequently, you know, when it, it's down to governments to communicate what's actually happening, um, the message can become very diluted, you know, and so there's a need for education and outreach as, as well as action and so on, which is kind of what brought me to, to Earth Percent, you know, which is a, a hugely brilliant summation of all of those things. Um, it is a simple approach to what's happening in the world. And I think we all feel the same way that, you know, this, this COVID crisis is a moment to step back and think about the world that we want to reemerge to, of course, um, uh, but also a time to make decisions as well, you know, and, and just decide who we're going to be in, in the world that we go back to. Because I think we all agree that, you know, whereas we hope that there will be a vaccine for, for COVID-19, um, there isn't as quick a fix for what's happening with the climate. And, you know, uh, there is no there's no silver lining in a time of, you know, profound sorrow, but, but if, if we don't learn from it and learn how interdependent we are as a species, um, then it truly is a failure of our ability to reflect and learn and, and adapt to things. And so that's why being asked to be a, a small part of Earth Percent was a, a, a huge opportunity as I saw it, because, you know, the concept is so simple, you know, um, you know, it, it, it's obviously, a very uh, easy thing to do. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, uh, you know, whether everything that it's up to is, is ready to be announced just yet because it is the beginning of a journey, but it's a simple one. It's saying don't just advocate, but also reach into your pocket and put your money where your mouth is, you know, and, and that's the industry. You know, so there's a 2007 study, which I learned via Earth Percent that uh, the, the UK music industry alone put over a half million tons of carbon into the atmosphere. Um, in a single year. And of course, as the industry has grown, it's probably only become 
worse, you know? So, so how do you respond to that as an industry? And, and I think the answer is more than with just words. Um, you respond with decisions to, to, to be better. And um, so what Earth Percent will do is ask the industry to actually donate a, a, a portion of its revenue toward important groups, you know, um, you know Client Earth, you know, um, being hugely uh, successful already makes sense as, as one of the immediate beneficiaries, certainly, but there will be more as well. Uh, and so I guess really connected with a lot of the other charity work I've been involved with, um, what I've always found is um, it doesn't matter. And I think you asked a really important question is how do you get big bands to do things? You know, the truth is you just, you give them a simple plan, you know, um, how do I help? I agree with all of this. What do I need to do? You know, and, and that's what earth percent is, is it is a simple but powerful concept that I think people are going to, uh, you know, you know, continue to respond really positively towards because, you know, it, it, it's this critical moment we're at, you know, um, you know, the, I mean, the human family, um, is in an absolute crisis right now, but it's only a prelude to what we believe is coming, what's already happening. I mean, you know, the Arctic is over 100 degrees Fahrenheit right now. I mean, 38 Celsius. I mean, you know, I mean, if that's not a wake up call, that's, uh, you know, a shocker. But I guess, you know, above the alarm bells of what's happening with this pandemic, there's a much louder one that's being rung for a much longer time and, and much more loudly. And, and that's what we see happening before our eyes and it's not speculative anymore. We, we're actually witnessing it. No, fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, one thing which is, uh, I think, um, important and it will be good to, um, good to hear from, um, from the whole panel is um, we'll start with Laura again, just to continue this, the cycle, but it'll be good just for people um, on this webinar to hear the immediacy of it. Because when we hear the government and they're saying, okay, we're going to reduce our carbon targets by 2050, by 2030, and all these other incremental changes. Now what's coming, what is coming out from your research and from what you're reading in terms of the immediacy of the, the, crisis that we are actually in so for everyone who's listening in and wants to do something is this something for them to wait five years you know we'll get out of coronavirus start touring again and then wait or is it something else well i guess the, the, the piece of work that i would refer immediately to is is the ipcc report of the Inter intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change special report that was released i believe it was november uh, 2018 which actually coincided with that big search in the kind of social commitment and 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 presence on the streets, you know, through through Greta, through Extinction Rebellion, and the different emergency declarations, I think that was a bit of a trigger because that special report was really looking at these targets, these big kind of, you know, they feel far away. They feel like what is 1.5 degree, you know what does this really mean? And what uh, but is is 1.5 better? But but it could be and it's, it's two degrees. But you know, so why is in that in that half a degree? So that 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 report actually was in really investigating what all of this means in terms of the kind of catastrophes that we are seeing, and we will see more of in the next, you know, 20 to to 30 years. But also with that report. Um, Throw up is, is a bit of a time frame, and in, in, in how long do we have to actually implement the infrastructures and the changes, the kind of big, you know, as Isla was saying, this big, you know, systemic changes and investments that will enable us to really meet that target. So, what does it look like? And it gives us, a, it gave us in 2018 a, a kind of time frame of 12 years. So, it's now rapidly shrinking. So, we're looking at a decade, which is two. If you look at it from the, the perspective of, of financial cycles, it's two financial cycles, if you like, for an organization, uh, that we need to look at those big infrastructural changes on transport, energy, food production, uh, and so on, that, that they need to be happening now, implemented in the next, you know, in the next decade. Uh, for, for us, as societies, to be, to, to, ha to stand a chance to actually reduce those impacts uh, sorry those those emissions so actually global warming doesn't go above two degrees two Celsius two, you know two degrees or, or 1.5 even better so that's that's the, the kind of Paris agreement says to kind of keep global warming under two degrees if possible 1.5 but as we were saying that's that that report which I recommend if you 
if you have a bit of time to read, it does explain quite, quite well what is in that health or degree. And it's a hell of a lot of like uh, havoc that goes into that. I mean, the, the, the kind of human suffering, uh, you know, because it's, it's causing a lot more instability in, in, you know, in the kind of weather patterns and therefore reliability on, on food production and livability of places and cities and, uh, and communities and so on. So, uh, it's, yeah, it sounds like 10, 10 years is not that, you know, it, sound, it can sound like it's a lot of time, it's not that long. Um, I think that the, the interesting thing is that we have known about this, uh, this challenge for over, mm -hmm. I mean, with certainty, with absolute certainty from, from scientists for over 30 years. Um, so we really have left it really late. We're cutting it really fine. That's not to say that it's not possible. I'm just saying that, you know, governments really have to put the will and not just the will and not just the talk, but also the investment, the actual, you know, shift in those policies and where the money goes and how we actually uh, reinvent an economy that actually brings everyone on board, that actually looks at the skills that we're gonna need to democratize those systems, um, uh, to really make it uh, really possible and really just as well. Huge signs that we've seen, you know, we were talking about uh, the industry doing, you know, something, you know, just to give a bit of hope as well. We w we've been working with a large cohort of 700, 800 organizations uh, through the Arts Council England partnership that we have uh, since 2012. That partnership is looking at a program of activity and support that is actually tracking the carbon footprint of, of that portfolio of organizations uh, since 2012. And we have actually seen that just by having a, a program of reporting uh, that also looks at having an action plan and uh, having a policy and also some obviously support from the resources that we've been producing over the years that are, by the way, all available on our website on the hub kind of resources. We have seen that actually carbon emissions related to energy consumption, for example, have actually gone down by 35% since 2012. So it is possible. And this is with our actual investment uh, from the Arts Council England in the actual infrastructure of the sector. These are the kind of quick gains that organizations just through thinking about this, the, the processes of their activities and, and implementing some, some changes uh, have managed to achieve. So it didn't actually have an, an investment, industrial investment plan. I think we need to start seeing ourselves as an industry, as a kind of, you know, we do, we do have a lot to offer to this, to this economy, to, to the cultural life, to the, you know, to, you know, to societies. And, uh, and it's, it's worth investing in, in this transition because we're already underway on it. And we're doing it without much, much help in, 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 in this instance, but it is definitely possible. Yeah, so um, on, on that point of saying these small gains, which don't actually cost you anything. So Isla, you are ahead of the game as an agent, if you're talking to your acts in terms of saying, okay, look, how can we amend our touring schedules and our habits to make them more um, sustainable or being more environmentally conscious? How have you found, or how did you find those conversations change over the years and do you think it's now a case that if artists say myself or peers or other people aren't thinking about it they're going to be left behind and be behind the curve how, how have you found artists taking on that message and then pushing it forward over the past few years up to now i mean i guess like all of us there's uh, as we reach kind of the deadline let's call it people are super focused on it. And so it becomes easier. It becomes easier for, um, to have those conversations with venues, to have that with fans, about, fa about travel, uh, to have with festivals as well, because there's so much that's not within the power of artists to give. Um, and so I guess that whole conversation has changed quite a lot. Um, saying that, I do, I do think we're kind of caught, aren't we, between um, wanting to make personal change and that being a sort of virtuous circle of, of making those changes and that informing the wider conversation about making a societal transition and also needing to make the drastic changes that we need to be in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, something like we talked earlier about coronavirus, like that's, a, is potentially, it, 
it's a terrible, it's a deep economic challenge for everybody and it's going to be the worst that we've experienced for a hundred years plus. But there's so many, there's so much trillion dollar stimulus money that's gone into the, into p keeping people in jobs and keeping them fed. And the second wave of stimulus is beginning now and that's decided by governments. And I guess that's again what Julie's bicycle um, letter touches on. So the opportunity is that the second wave of stimulus, which is starting now and will run for the next 18 months or so, the opportunity there is that those trillions of dollars can help move us towards the Paris Agreement and prevent biodiversity loss and encourage the resilient communities that we're going to need to weather the worst of uh, climate crisis. And so there's a sort of one-off chance here to focus governments on spending that money to move us in a sustainable direction. Um, meanwhile, I think all the voices around ECHO in that message are really useful uh, because yeah, that money won't come again. Yeah, so um, on that point, just to, just to build on that, because um, one thing looking at, let's say, Black Lives Matter, uh, mm -hmm. why it's sort of what's different this time as opposed to um, previous times and also the UK versus the US. One thing obviously civil rights um, movement and, and the like advocacy has been quite strong in the US for a number of years. One thing that's interesting this time is yes this terrible tragedy um, uh, happened with um, George, the murder of George Floyd but you're seeing off the back of that people were saying look this is, you should write to the police department. This is, you should get in touch of the, the head of the, the local government here. You should get in charge. This is for bail fund. This is how you could, you know, attack the legal, the governmental and everything. And then it was all wrapped up there yeah. uh, to push because those are the, the cogs and the wheels in motion rather than me as a, as a citizen or individual saying, oh, I've got to wait for the election in X number of years or something mm -hmm. like that. And this can't affect me. What are the sort of things which somebody on the ground can somebody can do in those smaller things in terms of push the local decision makers here not just wait for the big government thing uh i mean in terms of and it might well be the something that um laura can talk to better because definitely client earth is it has a focus on the law and it is one part of a vast environmental movement um and it's not really doing advocacy work unless it's legal advocacy work. Um, in terms of what we need from people, let's say, or how we want people to be involved, uh, yeah, we want uh, the amplification of our message. Uh, we need the, our peers in the enviro environmental movement to also be uh, talking about these issues. Um, um, I guess, going back to what you were just saying about racial justice and climate justice being interlinked i because if they are so interlinked because if we want to successfully address climate change we need everybody and so we need people of color too uh, and the sheer magnitude of transforming our energy and buildings and food systems and and the energy systems more more well, striving to reach these net zero carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions, it's already overwhelming. And so we need everybody on board because of that. Um, there's a sort of interlinked thought between gender equality, racial equality, and what we're striving for, which is uh, climate justice at the same time. But Again, I've not answered your question of individual, what individual actions can we do? I've just wandered away from it. But um, what I need, what we need, what Client Earth needs, I'm sure what Julie's Bicycle needs as well, is uh, individual people approaching us, asking to help to, to amplify the message. That's it. It's all about conversations. A lot of those conversations are not fleshed out at all. Yeah, it's just people, Spotify, SoundCloud, whoever coming on board saying we'd like to help. Uh, we're trying to sort of quickly build a movement uh, or continue building a movement with very, uh, to, to spread this message out as quickly as possible. 
Okay, great. Yeah. Mm. So um, no, it was good, especially to um, to add with um, the other thing where there's a the gender um, disparity and inequality as well, and how it affects and how it just all of these inequalities, as um, Alex was saying earlier, they all add up to um, on top of each other. So I mean, is there's um, Laura? Do you have anything to add in terms of saying what are the smaller bits of advocacy which might be like a local government rather than the the national government or planning yeah. board or whatever so just to start by and I, and I completely understand i'm completely with isla that it's only so much that you can do as an individual and you feel very rapidly you feel disempowered when you kind of start walking the walk and actually see okay there's only so much that i can take this this forward without actually being a societal transformation that i'm completely left it's completely out of my my control um but it is there is something about walking the walk starting that journey yourself that will enable you to understand the nature of the transformation the deep transformation that we all face in here that it is something like no other that we had before like at least not in the last 200 years it is going to require us all to really cooperate at a level that probably we've never done before and and that walk in the walk will actually enable you to understand that that the nature of the transformation but also the nature of what is needed what what are the gaps what are, what is really missing and that that knowledge that deep felt lift knowledge is what you can then use in this kind of when i was talking about joining other groups and collaborating you know just to give a couple of examples on how we've seen this being successful that bit of um program activity that has been so successful with the arts council england started with a little bit of soft lobbying by individuals that got together and it was a it was a little letter again you know not to, not, not that the letters are going to solve everything but at the crucial crucial times with the with individuals will uh behind behind it can actually unlock this these wider changes and at the time 2012 when arts counseling was just about to release the the, 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 the kind of funds for the next three to four years with, for the national portfolio organizations, this big portfolio of, you know, the, they're some of the big ones as well, the Royal, you know, sorry, the Royal Opera House, the National Theatre, Opera North, uh, we're just talking about big organizations that receive constant funding from, from Arts Council. And that letter actually convinced them to include these environmental requirements to the funding agreements. There was a policy intervention that happened and as a result, the literacy, commitment, and in kind of organizational uh, leadership that uh, as a result we're seeing is incomparable. It's not happening in any other country in the world. Uh, and this is as a result of those, that group of people getting together to put an idea forward and lobby for it. So that's an example of it. But uh, another one is, for example, in Manchester, there's this group that started, I think it's 2010, a, a group of 30 organizations again the multi-art like you know the very kind of like different disciplines from the ITV to um, the Royal Exchange Theatre uh, they got together and created a group called uh, the Manchester Arts Art Sustainability Team they, they literally got together just to collaborate to share experience to co-invest a little bit as mm -hmm. much as they could in some solutions where they're looking at kind of green energy procurement or looking at co-creating a kind of pathway together, uh, sharing what works, sharing what doesn't work. And, and eventually they, they became, uh, and through showing, through tracking the, the impact that they were achieving and the reductions that they were achieving, they were able to present a very compelling case to, to the Manchester City Council and to say, we're a crucial part of your climate strategy. You won't, you won't do it without us because, you know, we're doing it already. We know what it's about. We know what the challenges are, but we're also in touch with these thousands, tens of thousands of people in the city that they trust us as, as institutions. They trust that, that you know, that, that we convey the values uh, that they want to see themselves reflected in. And then we bring in the variety of voices and responses and solutions uh, that you need because we're in touch with our communities. Um, so it is very powerful what, you know, 30 individuals getting together around the table can achieve. And they are now crucial part of the 2030 target that they have in Manchester. So they've gone not for 2050, they actually have set themselves a 2030 um, zero carbon uh, 
for themselves as a city and they, they have developed a very successful plan um, already to, to, to achieve that. So all I'm trying to say is that it starts with the individual and I think we need to just basically associate and collaborate and share and then basically not underestimate what a bit of lobbying and advocacy and writing to our MPs or writing to our kind of local authorities or our funders to, to suggest we have this great idea, we have this R&D thing going, but we don't have the funding to, to, to try it. And, but we could scale it, we could achieve this. So it's about, yeah, I guess it's about, you know, starting the journey and sharing, getting together and, and just, just truly believing that everything, everything counts because everything does count. I think that's a, I think that's a very good point because, and, and it reminds me just of, of something where it goes back to Alex's earlier point where you have a, a, a specific goal, which is straightforward because that just reminds me of lobbying these galleries, like the natural portrait gallery in terms of their sponsorship of, of BP and the like. It's, it's the, it's the, that's a simple, it's a simple goal. It's not going to say it's going to solve everything, but again, it's a simple goal. You've got the principle and people came together. And um, another example for the people more on the electronic music side um, of things um, here even in Brixton there was a in terms of local advocacy there was a, the big campaign um, to save Nur, um, a local uh, greengrocer that was under under threat from gentric gentrification um, of the the owners of Brixton market who just wanted to plow them out and then move that shop and they were going right against the the, um, the deadline but it's the campaign and then it came the different electronic musicians who are around Brixton and, and why they gave more voice to that campaign once it started going and now the, the shop has been saved and also the rents um, um, have been kept down. So I do think it, um, that's, that's a good thing to, to highlight to, to people. There might be campaigns in your local area or something where you, know, you can get together. Um, so I want to ask another question, which is close to my heart to, um, to Alex, um, in terms of obviously being a music, musician with a science background and how um, yourself as an archeologist um, originally and with your, uh, with your work with the European Space Agency, how you want to have your festival of science and well, how you've had festivals of science and culture, talking about science literacy and how to bring that to um, the fore and to, because it seems like we've got, we've got the, the policy, we've got organizations with the policy and, and other, the legal and the advocacy, but then on the science part to show people, maybe engage people and in, into this course, because it is a science thing. Indeed, indeed. Well, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, just uh, uh, echoing, you know, so much of what's uh, already been said, um, but something you said at the very start, um, you know, which is the subversion of uh, Donald Trump's Tulsa rally. Um, you know, um, I, uh, I think, you know, has there ever been a more powerful, you know, indication of just how clued in the up and coming generation is, and also just how effective they can be, you know, and uh, so in talking about things like Earth Percent, for instance, there's a uh, there's a flip side to it all. Um, it gives artists and music lovers a choice, you know, to support organizations that care about these issues. And so that's a simple kind of thing. But you know, fundamentally, you have to have a population of people that are that are educated as well. You know, and and, and this is one of the big things. You know, and I remember when the Guardian um, took what seems like a bold step, right? Um, you know, uh, they stopped calling it climate change. They said it is not climate change, it is a climate crisis, right? It's not, oh, there's smoke. It's like the building is on fire. Let's stop talking about it like, you know, it's a, uh, a sort of feature in the distant landscape. Um, it's happening right now and all around us, you know? And, uh, you know, I guess the, uh, the issue there is simply the choice of language itself is so, so very important. And uh, with some of the work that I've already done, um, it is about outreach and science education and talking about these issues, not in solely alarmist ways, but I think positively and constructively and saying that you can make choices that will make a difference, right? You know, it's, it's that, that old saying of, you know, just like, you know, think globally, act locally, you know, just some of the stories that came up now is, you know, um, you might not be able to upend everything, but you can make choices and decisions. And I think that a lot of that begins 100% with education and caring about things. I think part of the problem is that we've allowed for too long media organizations, politicians to gloss over these issues as if they're not important. And, you know, it does 
100% linked with Black Lives Matter. I mean, racism is like so many other issues at the heart of what's happening in our climate, you know, as well, because, you know, this is something that we have, you know, as Laura said a little earlier, have been ignoring for about 30 years. And the reason for that is because it's for so long been something that's been happening to other people in the Amazon, people that we don't have to see, effects that we don't have to endure. And now all of a sudden we're being confronted with something that we can no longer, you know, ignore, you know? Um, and, and so uh, it's not just uh, advocacy, it's not just making decisions, it's giving consumers a choice as well. You know, and I think that's why so much of this is important, you know, this conversation that we're having, because I, I think as you said very well, they're all the different levels. They're all the, the building blocks that we need to be able to affect change. And more than anything else with COVID, we actually have a pause button right now to think about these things because the music industry specifically is unfortunately enduring a, a bit of a, a pause right now, um, you know, which is horrible, but, but man, what, what a golden moment for us to think about things. And so, um, yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the science work that I have done, um, you know, has been hugely inspiring, but, you know, you talk to scientists, um, you know, quick, quick rundown of the European Space Agency, right? It is 22 nations cooperating to do things together. I mean, how often do you hear something like that? You know, they, they provide over half the world's climate data, you know, and, and they, they, without any dilution, show exactly what is happening. I mean, you say, um, okay, well, we had, a, we had a heat wave in 2017. Well, there was a heat wave 100 years ago, sure. And these are all the sort of counter arguments to, to the climate crisis that you hear. And it's like, yeah, sure, there is a heat wave 100 years ago, but we've never seen it in every single time zone before. You know? and, and this is before what we're now recording in the Arctic. You know? I mean, these are huge resounding you know, uh, alarm bells. But the problem is that scientists and people who advocate, you know, that knowledge um, are not always placed in the right places. Artists, however, are placed in the right places. And so they have a powerful platform to, to educate, to inspire, um, and to, to get people, you know, that choice. And so that's, that's why this little round table is, I think, a, a powerful microcosm, I think, of what's happening in a wider way um, to catalyze people into to making the right choices when, whenever we do reemerge. Well, that's, that's fantastic and perfectly time to um, end the, uh, the hour or so of the, of the panel discussion here. So I'd like to um, thank the panelists, Laura, Isla and Alex, and also to remind people to go to, you can check out um, Julie's Bicycle. Um, you can go onto their hub to find out everything and also to look at um, uh, Client Earth, as well just to see and see how you can report and to how to link up and alex who where would you like to point people to um go to uh, earth percent immediately and um, find out how to uh, get information um how to sign up how to support um you know i i uh, I, I don't want to give too much away but i've never been in a more inspiring room full of people than the first meeting of earth percent that i was at and um uh it's big it's big, it's gonna be great. And uh, it's going to change things, but only with the support of people who might be watching, who can themselves participate or invite others to as well. Um, I'd echo that because I've been fortunate to be in the room there. And also I think it's very important, again, just to, to broaden the conversation. So we're not just preaching to the converted. And for myself, just speaking to other artists, you will find um, artists do want to, they're people too, <laughs> they're, they're humans um, uh, with, um, with families, with friends and with everybody else and they do want to reach out but then it's those tangible things just to think how best to um, approach it so hopefully you can build a coalition and push that forward. So I think next is going to the Q&A section here and um, in terms of questions, uh, I'm not sure Will the questions appear? How is it going to run? Will the questions appear in the chat? I'm not 100% sure. Oh, there is a Q&A. Oh, I've seen. Okay. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Paolo. Oh, also, sorry, I got to um, thank the Halley as well for bringing, bringing us all together. And um, obviously it was um, disappointing that it wouldn't be up and running and we couldn't do this in live in the flesh but hopefully as the crisis um eases up or is safer we can 
be responsible, um, we can do that. And the, the Halley is in Haggerston and it's opening up in July. So here is a question. What can the music business really do to combat the climate change, to combat climate change? And as, an, and as individuals, what are the next steps we have to take to turn around within the next 10 years? So I'm not sure who wants to go first on that. It's two questions in one, I guess. What can the music business really do to combat climate change? And then as individuals, um, what next? What are the next steps we have to take to turn it around within the next 10 years? So who'd like to go first? And uh, I'll have a stab at that, which feels like answering the question which I didn't answer when you asked it previously. <laughs> so there's a sort of beautiful justice in it. Um, yeah, I guess as the music industry, as musicians should be looking uh, at our own activities, first of all, as we've all just discussed there, um, we're talking about adding to this virtuous cycle of pressure to affect change. I think Music Declares Emergency have a great list of actions you can take, whether you're a label, publisher, agent, musician, etc. I, and I think one of the most important messages I have to say is don't be shy about telling people what you're doing. Uh, it's not a will I post or should I not post a black square and is that performative thing. It's This is one time which you have to be performative because I think it's really important to forget and ignore any criticism of hypocrisy. Uh, we're all doing the best we can. Um, moving forward as quickly as we can. And I think it's really uh, vitally important that we're all talking about the changes that we're making. Um, and yeah, uh, that's it really. And as a, as a overarching kind of thing, I would say, um, what we have to do in the next 10 years is a gargantuan task. Um, and we've got to get to something close to net zero. So, um, answers on a postcard yeah i'll just uh before next panelist and um, before alex was going to say something and um, one thing i think we have all noticed is this coronavirus crisis has changed our natural habits it's changed it so people already are i mean the plane stopped flying so we we did that within uh, globally did that within um a, f a few weeks so um, before one of the big, um, and this is the interesting thing, one of the big changes was we can't make, that will disrupt the economy. Well, the economy has been disrupted whether we like it um, or not. So anyway, Alex was going to say, sorry. Oh, no, it was just very quickly that, uh, you know, on behalf of um, Earth Percent, I should say earthpercent.com has a newsletter sign up, then people can find out immediately um, how they'll be able to support that as that emerges into the world and uh, you know i'd say that you know fundamentally again you know this is about people making individual choices but also deciding to support the organizations that support the issues that are important to them and uh, i think this at least the music industry is going to be a beacon for that and um you know i think that it could be a very powerful one but only with participation so um i said go to earth percent before i didn't add the dot com so i just wanted to correct that if i could okay brilliant and then laura is there anything yeah, just to, um, I, I, I guess, you know, there's, many, many, there's no one silver bullet uh, that will actually just be, this is the one thing that, the, you know, the music business will have to do. It, it, is, it is a transformation and it will be a, um, a, a, a kind of journey. It doesn't happen overnight. I guess what it is, is about, first of all, as an organization or as an individual, as an artist, whatever it is that you do within the business, is understanding yourself within within the actual crisis and 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 really telling yourself okay my my thing is about writing songs or my thing is about running this uh label company uh but what what are the values i aligned with uh ultimately you know what is it what i aspire to do as an organization or as an individual and really kind of have map out what that all of that all of that has to do with with the with the climate crisis, with you know, with this great challenge that we have, uh, the implications with this social injustice that we were talking about, this climate change has been, you know, the effects of it has been felt already across the globe, just by the you know the most deprived communities, the most vulnerable ones, and uh, us here, we we can still think about adaptation. M most countries in the global south won't be able to to access that kind of 
investment and you know so i think if you do care about you know um women if you do care about people of color if you do care about you know all of these great things that we all as individuals care about you do care about climate change what is it that you can do as a business you have to really align deeply with your values with that and then act accordingly so what is needed is you know in the practical level you have to if you can switch to 100 percent renewables uh you know just try and look about how you plan your tools and you know whether you need to get on that many planes so you can get on on that many trains and you know i'm just being simplistic here but there there are the, the big things that will um feed, feed the shift that needs to happen uh renewables 10 years ago felt like a like a faraway thing like you know it was never going to be a kind of um sustainable way of 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 you know providing electricity and you know it is now providing i think you know last time i checked it was like 30 to 35 percent of the uk's uh you know, generation. Uh, so it is. It is happening. It certainly is. Uh, you know, something that that we can all contribute to. But is that the decisions? And those decisions will stem from our values, from our alignment with this subject and everything that matters to us. Also, Laura, um, a, a similar question is: So when you were back with Festival Republic, so with Reading, Leeds, and the like, and you were doing um, your your work there, how have you found dealing with the other companies and the like when you were in that role now and how have you seen the shift change to to now well that was a, a, a very good question it was um so working at the festival everyone who's worked at the festival will know that this is like it's like working in a city there's so much infrastructure that you have to put in place so you can it's, it's a it's a big ecosystem of people and and there is a very very short time frame and something really big and the big deadline that can't be moved needs to happen. And, uh, and basically is a lot of it is a lot of collaboration, communication, setting very clear targets for what, you know, as, what would you would like to happen. It cannot be something that you impose just as a kind of festival producer, uh, but it's something that has to, has to be born from a conversation. As a festival public at the time, we do care about this. And we, we feel that this is what needs to happen. And that conversation happened with, uh, with the power generators, the, the power providers, with the, the caterers, with the, you know, with the crew, with everyone. So there was a, a little policy created out of those conversations. And, and it is a trial and fail sometimes because we all, we all tend to want to simplify and find the shortcuts. And we, you know, we develop a, a production system that works for 20 years and suddenly you want to change it and it's like oh this is very difficult it's making my life very difficult but if it's a conversation and it's an inspired conversation that both parties or everyone involved wants want to achieve it becomes it becomes a bit of a um an adventure that you're going together on uh, so I, this is what i learned that it was not about imposing things but about having a a, a good conversation with your suppliers contractors and many, many beautiful things happened. Like, you know, we had for the first time, you know, uh, diesel generators speaking, you know, with solar power batteries so they could just work together. And, you know, or, you know, we, you know, we did things that, you know, that, that weren't thought before, like having, you know, char like electric charging for electric cars in the car park. Um, so yeah, and it, the, all of that was born of like goodwill from both sides, always. So it's, had, it's always had to has to be a conversation. Yeah, thank you, and Alex. Yeah, I well, I actually had a quick question, just building on that, because I'm actually really curious um, as to your perspective, uh, and you know, because uh, I just wonder if if there is more of a if you build it, it will come mentality. If there was a market that was created for suppliers that were creating green options for artists and you know the promoters behind them to use and so on, then that's that's kind of the, the key, isn't it? Because I, I don't know what your experience has been, but I would find I would I would wonder if the first roadblocks that you would hit in those sorts of conversations is when it comes down to to cost. You know, um, well, it cuts into our margins, so we just can't make that decision. But if there are actually greener options that are also more economical, which is sometimes you know, the case, um, you know, then, well, the, I guess it's just, well, who's going to draw first? But, you know, you're, you're basically creating options for businesses to 
you know, uh, choose greener options, but you're also creating like a, a right market for people to move into that space as well. I mean, yeah. anyone who looks at, you know, something that is interlinked with all this, you know, uh, you know, I remember when someone told me what veganism was 15 years ago, and I just blinked at them for five seconds because I just, I, you know, I wasn't familiar with that. You know, but but now look at the explosion of vegan options. You know, that's in the market. You know, I mean, if someone told me 15 years ago there would be huge options in uh, you know supermarkets, you know, um, I'd have been said, well, they must be joking. And obviously, it's not to conflate the two things, but it's very obvious that you know when you establish that there is a consumer base that can make choices, um, you know, you create a market and a viable business place for people to move into, and and that's that's kind of that creates that virtuous circle, doesn't it? You know, so. I wonder, I mean, have you just kind of hit roadblocks in that way when it, when it actually comes down to, to costs and, and the choices people need to make? When I was a Festival Republic, definitely. Definitely the kind of balance that you have to keep uh, with that. And um, I think the, 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 the good thing is to have, um, perhaps, I mean, this is what I think was game, game changing, is to actually have one person really looking into all of this um, obviously, sustainability is something that needs and must go across all departments. You cannot sit in silo with one person, but that one person kind of coordinating what the strategy is and actually just uh, logging in what the kind of um, financial implications are. There are areas, definitely, that will cost more money, and that's, that's a, that is a fact. And, and that there were decisions that were made, you know, on the basis of, okay, so what are the other areas where we're going to be able to to save some money because we're doing the right thing as well? So there were, you know, around, you know, for example, just a Latitude Festival, just, just to put an example, and I won't offer the exact figures, but there was definitely by introducing the reusable cup, although it was a massive logistical change for the, for the bars and it was a pain in the neck for them to, they have to get their heads around about how we're going to do this following kind of health and safety rules and da 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 and you know but we worked it out it was worked out and it was implemented a whole stream of waste was eliminated which means you don't need those skips in on site you don't need to pay for the disposal of those cups uh, and so on and and effectively it generated a revenue uh, avenue as well because those cups had a, had a deposit uh, they were there to be returned but what happened is that they were beautiful and people love latitude and wanted to keep them so they became a bit of a merchandise thing. So it generated a bit of profit in a way. It wasn't the intention, but it did happen. And there was some kind of gains and some pains, if you like. So putting those the solar power batteries and trying to get that technology to speak to each other was effectively an organizational decision born from the commitment of the organization to really want to push that innovation space. As a result of that moment of these generators and batteries speaking to each other, which was hugely unsuccessful, I have to say, <laughs> because they were not prepared to, the technologies weren't prepared to speak to each other, but the power company actually invested in solar power batteries and it started a conversation with this company to really embed them from the beginning. So an innovation route started there. So yeah. What I'm trying to say is that there will be some some downsides to this, and we have to commit. We have to put our our money, uh, you know, our money where our mouth is. Really, uh, we wouldn't think twice about not having harnesses or helmets on site because they're too expensive expensive to have. Uh, because they're lives, and we care about people's lives, right? Uh, so this is the same, and and we just need to get to a point where there's the balance sheet. You have to reflect what you care about. And, you know, there will be some gains and there will be some not gains. But I think the conversation is much bigger than, than that. Uh, yeah. So, um, I'm going to do a question. Sorry. No, no, no. no. I was genuinely curious. Thank you. Um, yeah, so one thing I was, I was just um, thinking, I guess is a question for myself, and I don't know whether maybe, uh, well, for all of, all of you, and maybe Isla um, might be the best place, but obviously we've seen, let's say in the uh, film industry with Me Too, you've seen um, there was the, the, the concept of the inclusion rider and uh, saying, okay, I'm not going on set if it doesn't have a, a gender split on the actual set. Oh, I'm not getting involved. The big, big um, directors and big... Um, um, art um, actors doing that. So I was wondering, 
Is there a broader concept, because there are a few managers on um, in this webinar, is there the concept of the sustainability rider as well? And has that been pushed out saying, okay, with this festival, we're expecting this, you know, we're expecting this and that. Uh, yes, there's lots of floating around different uh, green riders, some which have been made by Paradigm Agency, some which have been made by Live Nation, some which have been made by a greener festival. So there's a range of these uh, riders. And, but there's not yet, funnily enough, I was in a meeting yesterday where we were just talking about more or less that exact thing. One kind of cohesive uh, rider, which would ultimately just be guidelines because you can't have one or two riders for a wild range of different people. Um, but yeah, there's also a uh, pushback on, you know, having written into your contracts, like pushing back on venues, checking if they're, uh, use renewable energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I think it's uh, definitely worth something worth doing for sure. Uh, and I, and again, just because it's a conversation changer or a society changer, you know, it's an indication of the direction you intend to travel. I'll just check the I'll just check the Q and A. It doesn't seem are there any more questions uh, at all from the from the listeners here? I'll just wait and see whether there's any extra question here. Um, but um, on that point, I definitely think um, a more coordinated uh, when we come out of this, a more coordinated approach would be sensible because of course we don't know coronavirus i personally feel not scientifically but i just feel that, you know it's the earth telling us we're imbalanced we're not doing things properly you know and if we think we're clever enough to beat nature or science well it's showing us um another way but it does seem in the music industry just a lot of people doing it because this is how things were done before there's a lot of waste and you only you only encounter that when things go bad for example being a from London and being performing with a band, performing in Scotland at Tea in the Park, as it was called, and then your your bus breaks down and you realise that there are four separate, almost half-empty tour buses coming down the same route, so you have to hitch a ride. It's it's a bit of a waste, and I think it does require egos, whether it's a management, band, label, whatever, just to do things sensibly. You can't have four 50-people buses coming down all from the same place. Yeah, so Alex, we... Yeah, no, um, I, no I, th I think you're absolutely right there. And uh, I think an important word was used earlier, which is innovation. Uh, you know, I mean, just look at how we're communicating over Zoom. You know, uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, I think I read that Zoom itself was, you know, worth more than the top seven airlines combined. Um, this is like a month ago. And I, it, it's for obvious reasons, but, you know, it, it just goes to show that, uh, you know, change is possible. But also um, what I think will happen in this time, or at least what I hope does, is it will move the needle on on what we value, uh, what's important, the kind of decisions we're willing to make. Because I mean, it's there's there is no uh, joy in what is happening now. But you know, when you look at what happens, where you know, climate scientists and ourselves are saying we had no idea that the change could happen this quickly. You know, when you when you see those orbital photographs of uh, you know Milan, for instance where it literally just looks like there hasn't been a city there for a hundred years because the earth restored itself that quickly. Um, it just goes to show that this is far from a lost cause. This is far from something that is, you know, uh, too late that we can make choices, um, you know, that, uh, that will change things, you know? And, and so I, I think it's all going to be down to the lessons that we learned from all this, you know, just what, you know, happens when normalcy, if it ever is, restored the way it was. And in many ways, I don't want to go back to what normalcy was. I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, it's going to be like what learnings we take from this experience um, that will determine, you know, kind of what happens next, right? You know, and I guess that's the, the thing that, that worries me is that I want this conversation to continue beyond, you know, the day that we can all go outside safely without any worry of what might happen. Yeah. And um, one thing I'd say as an artist and having spoken to, as I speak to loads of different um, artists, um, what I've found is um, you may, I, I, at first I thought, okay, my artist friends, they have lots on their mind. Um, but then it's quite nice 
uh, talking to them about these environmental problems because they can they can see it and right now as a creative person you might be stressed because of the virus you might be stressed because you're not your all of your live income has has vanished so they've actually speaking to a significant number they've actually found talking about something different which isn't lockdown it isn't talking about when can we play live again it's not someone pressuring you for a new record which you know won't be released because <laughs> the labels don't know when they're going to release it something different is going which is going to affect you whether you stay in the music industry whether you don't stay in the music industry whether you release the album whether you don't release the album it's something positive where we can see the change and it's really encouraging to have um the the three of you here on the um panel alex isla and laura and the amazing work that now people are seeing julie's bicycle um, client Earth, um, and then now hopefully with Earth Percent um, coming through, people can see it, people are thinking about it, and there are ways in which you can plug in positively rather than us screaming at our Twitter feeds because this president or this prime minister has done this or that and the other. We can collectively do this. And the final thing is, I took a lot of encouragement from seeing the younger members of our society, the Greta Thunbergs, doing their climate strikes. That shouldn't be overlooked. So for us, if for our generations and for older, if we were stuck in our ways, um, thinking, okay, well, it's always been like that. The younger generation, they've got a completely different energy. So um, let's be encouraged by that rather than saying past five years, I've not made any inroads because they're loud and, um, and they're fantastic. So um, unless anybody else has any closing remarks at all, any final comments? Um, yeah, well, I'd, it's yeah, been very, very nice being here, talking with you all, very instructive for me. Uh, and thanks for having me, I guess, more than anything. Indeed. And thank you very much for hosting and the stimulating questions. It's a great group to be in. And uh, yeah, an important conversation that, uh, that I hope see continued in many different contexts. Yeah, likewise, it's been great. Uh, Isla, Alex, and Figa, it's been really inspiring to be hearing you all and, you know, to different approaches as well. So great to be part of the conversation. Great. So I encourage people do go on to um, Julie's Bicycle, the, um, the the hub there. There's so many resources. And then also see if you've got artists or you know artists or you've got organizations, then look how you can um, uh, plug into Client Earth and see how you can give your time or support in other ways if you're more financially able. And then for everybody else, go to earthpercents.com where you can sign up for, I think, the newsletter now and then just see and um, I think the main thing is everybody is working together instead of saying this is the ego of this company will win or this organization or this charity. It needs everybody's collective responsibility here. So I'd like to thank the Halley space um, as well for hosting these events and hopefully can see, well, stay safe, everybody, and can see you all in future, whether it's digitally or otherwise. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, all the participants for listening. Thanks. Bye, all. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah.